Do you have any high conviction beliefs about the extension of the standard model? So I don't have my high conviction belief is that anything that extends the standard model will look like a, 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 something so that's effective, effective field theory at low energy. So if I'm going to look for hints, experimental hints that are going to tell me which way right. the world actually works, my strategy is going to be write down everything I could imagine that would look like a change to the effective theory of the standard model and go look for that. Okay. And that's that is what most but, uh, most experimental that, programs but that, are looking but for. But that avoids the question. Do you personally have any high conviction beliefs? And, and I'll extend it. Do you think we have anything wrong in the standard model, not just in terms of the Lagrangian and its consequences, but in terms of how we talk about it? And do you have any high conviction beliefs for what extends it and what is likely to be true? That, that are really things like this I believe. Can you say the phrase okay, this I this, believe? I believe that the that the, the universe is Lorentz invariant at short distances, that the whatever unifies the standard model is not breaking Lorentz invariance. Um, Such that just, just a thought, such that if you observe, if we were to observe something yes. cosmologically or laboratory, that would break your conviction or it would cause you to, yes. to reveal excitingly new research. You, you, you believe in relativity. Yes, absolutely. That uh, is not very bold. I've, okay. Um, but, but I mean, most, by the way, sorry, most, most things that are being proposed as extensions to the standard model by definition are, are well, they might be they're, wrong. Most how, of them are wrong. How do you know, Eric? We haven't looked for actually. Well, because they can't all be correct. They're, they're not all compatible. No, with, some of them are mutually exclusive. Right. All I'm saying is this is to say that the universe is manifestly uh, Lorentz invariant is an interesting claim that could be falsified. And by falsification, I think that would excite you. That wouldn't depress oh, you. That wouldn't ruin your day. It would, would totally be... change how I but think. Doesn't this, I love your puppy point. Puppies are adorable. Ice cream is delicious. I understand. And mom yeah. and apple pie are, are no, good but, things. But, but there are, I mean, I think, I think that's a case where people have legitimately proposed ideas sure. that break learning. And they are interesting ideas. So, uh, you know, someone who had an idea that broke this principle that was within the kind of traditional community, but sure. really broke away from it was uh, Peter Harava with his, you know, non Lorentz variant solutions to gravity, uh, his proposal. And again, like, it was an interesting idea. I didn't look at that and go, I understood what he's doing. Right. We read those papers. Everyone's like, so that's you read, you read the idea. paper. You, you, like, but I also don't think it's the way the world works. Uh, and again, I also. That's not what I'm talking about. When, like if Zhao came out with something, maybe you look at it and then you say, okay, that's pretty wild. I don't buy it, but I understand but what I he's think, doing. I, but I think, again, the difference between Petter, who was definitely deviating away from the community, was not that they were like, he's a card carrying member of the community, is that he was able to communicate his idea in a way not, that made sense to everyone. And but that but I guess what I would say is like you're asking me to take a definitive position about a theory we can no, never no, no, test. No, no, no. I'm <laughs> saying that you're don't... a theoretical physicist. Yeah, absolutely. You, you are, you know. And to be fair to you, because I'm not. There's no gotcha or zinger here. I see you as mostly a cosmologist who is keeping the door open to particle theory through the conduit of effective theory, right? And I mean, that may not be fair because I've only well, been studying your stuff for a day. I understand. I, I guess what I would say is that I no effective field theory is life, right? Like it's like it's life. how it's how the it's how oh everything we organize. It's just it's all we see, right? I'm living here in this like there's not like Newton's laws weren't wrong. No, no, no. They're wait, just wait, an wait, effective wait, theory wait, relevant to if our. We were, if we were to talk about biology, right? So we okay. have the, we have the stratification. We have cytology, the study of cells below. Then we have histology, the study of tissues. Then we have physiology above that, and we have the organization and anatomy. And if you stay down at the level and saying, you know, it would be absolutely irresponsible for us to speculate into different regimes because we understand that we don't actually have information. We've learned the lesson of Ken Wilson very well. That would be pretty disappointing. If you think about, for example, Wheel of Fortune, there are these one letter solves where somebody actually guesses the entire puzzle from a single letter. Look up a guy named Rufus, for example. I understand. Now, my claim is, is, is that the, the, the dark side of the genius of Ken Wilson, and by the way, Ken Wilson is a good example. Like we just lost Jeff Beck as a guitarist. He was every professional electric guitarist's favorite guitarist, but he wasn't everybody's favorite guitarist who didn't play guitar. In a certain sense, Ken Wilson, uh, walks on water within the competent community of physics researchers. But there's a dark side also, uh, just the way Jeff Beck maybe put too much emphasis on the whammy bar, uh, of pushing everything into this realm where it's denuded of much of its meaning. Like if I were to say to you that the Higgs field shows up in effective theory as a spin zero fundamental scalar, but I don't think that that's its purpose. I think that it actually belongs to and the way in which it's disguised so that its spin appears different 
uh, than its naive spin, which is its function as a, as a part of a connection. Uh, that's something in which uh, effective theory is not going to necessarily point to that because effective theory tends to show you uh, this picture that is often denuded of higher level structures because we're now too afraid to guess. No, I, the, the idea is just that it, it, you can have as wild a variation of the difference of the origin of two theories as you like. And if I limit my observations to some energy scale right. that's set by colliders or whatever I can do, that the only way that I can tell them apart is by the parameters of the long distance. So now the parameters can be really useful hints. So in the 60s, Weinberg guessed at asymptotic freedom, which was that the idea that they're like, you know, the theory is really made up of, you know, quarks and things that look like microscopic particles just bouncing around, even though they live inside a proton. He guessed at this because of the specific relationships between certain of the couplings of, you know, nuclear physics, because we couldn't go and look inside of the proton at that point in history. Right. So it's absolutely true that through this lens, you can discover exactly as you're saying, you can within this lens say, ah, there's a pattern here and I can use the tools at my disposal to say the only way to get this pattern points at some deeper, deeper uh, structure. So that's exactly what we do. So for example, why proton decay experiments were so exciting because even though they're a low energy experiment, we they would tell us about physics at very high energies because we only know a few ways to create proton decay. Or this is why people are really excited about neutrino masses because neutrino ma masses hint at something going on at you know extremely high energies that we'll never ever be able to probe in the lab. But if you don't kind of, on the other hand, like if I write down a theory that only changes the, the gears of how the universe works on some scale that I can never observe, my only hope is to see it through the pattern. Of yeah, what's but going but on then you're, mis you're, 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 you're mislearning the lesson of the baryon, which is that the baryon isn't encoded into the Lagrangian, the quarks are, but that, uh, you know, I, I don't even know if we're talking a lot of say infrared slavery with a new uh, physics conscience. Uh, but, you know, the, the issue is, is that uh, protons and neutrons are not what is seen in the Lagrangian. You have to actually unpack them, uh, unpack the fundamental constituents to get the observable constituents. Now, that lesson, when overlearned, which is what I'm concerned your community has done, uh, becomes inhibitory. And everybody gets enervated because nobody wants to be the fool who didn't learn the lesson of effective theory and renormalization. And that's what, what's concerning me is, is that in general, we have a group of people who are incredibly worried about their union card and being respectable. And when they're heterodox, they're heterodox in the most mild and unhelpful way, particularly if you have a metastable state where small uh, perturbations don't work out very well. And so in all of these situations, you know, when I try to engage you in terms of if you want to actually talk physics on a podcast, we always talk around physics, we talk about physics, but we don't actually say, well, what do you believe? What do you, you know, what, what are the high conviction bets? And I'll, I'll say something more. I think you're an extremely good scientist. I've read some of your stuff. I don't aspire to be focused on good scientists because I believe that we have a confusion that great science is just good science turned up to 11. 